we've talked a bit about coalitions and the importance of coalitions in terms of achieving things and how important they are for leaders. And I can think of you know, several examples, but you know, if I looked at my life at Morgan Stanley, you know, I was first a lawyer, no line management responsibility, then the chief administrative officer. I wasn't a trader or a banker. Then I was the chief vice chairman and chief operating officer. I still wasn't a trader or a banker. But I was definitely responsible for getting the organization to do things that it was uncomfortable doing. That might have been, uh, in, in, in large part, that was getting them to come together across divisions. And it was, a, you know, investment banks are notoriously silo-oriented. And I had to find a way to get people to come together to do something that they just were really uncomfortable doing. And interestingly, I'd done so much work on, uh, in, in, in government on, on, on issues and in community organizations where people around the table had a different perspective, but m miraculously, would come to a great solution. And that was all about listening to people and also finding the right people, getting them in a room, uh, respecting different contributions and different uh, opinions, uh, and then moving together forward. And I think I took that back to Morgan Stanley, and that's exactly what we did. You know, we had common principles, co common vision. We we're going to turn this into one firm for our clients, um, and then made sure we had the right people in the room, including some difficult people, and then listened and came out of those meetings united. It was painful. It was difficult. We all know that homogenous teams work together more quickly, but it's not enduring. This, every day I just saw that these diverse teams, it was harder to get them to work together, but when they did, the result was very powerful, uh, and more importantly, very enduring. I think many business leaders feel that in order to lead their organizations, they need to be certain, they need to be very focused on what they do, they need to be confident. And moving outside your comfort zone naturally means that you're going to have less confidence. You're going to be doing things that you're uncomfortable with. Um, and for many people, asking someone else for their advice is not necessarily what someone in, in authority does. And I think the key for leaders is actually not to speak, but to listen and to listen to as many voices and diverse opinions as you can. And to do that, and to do that well, often you have to go beyond what you know. What you know very well that there is indeed a tendency to just sort of say, well, I know everything, when actually you probably don't. But to really learn to listen and to get a different perspective, you have to go beyond your own authority. And often getting engaged with people from very diverse backgrounds who have different problems, uh, but who bring a very unique and important perspective uh, can make a huge impact on a leader, particularly when they take that learning back into their own organization um, in terms of getting the best out of the people that they work with and who work for them. I, if we go back to the fundamental principle of the importance of diversity of opinion and diversity of talent and diversity of experience, and they're interlinked. And the, and, and the importance for current and future business leaders to experience things beyond their comfort zone. It's sometimes hard for companies to do. Big companies, maybe they have some programs, but, but many don't. Government departments don't. And what Common Purpose does, I think, fantastically, is it provides that critical link for business and for their people to a diversity of thought, talent, experience, and opinion that you just wouldn't be able to get on your own if you're, particularly if you're a medium size or you know, a new company in the UK. How do you do that? Uh, and Common Purpose, by, through its programs and its people and its alumni networks, I think does that fantastically. We've got to change the culture of leadership. Leaders have to be doing some of what Zenia was talking about, saying, I need diversity, how am I going to get it? You do it with other things, how you use resources. You don't just go through a bureaucratic process to make sure your back is covered. You make sure it happens. So that's leadership at 
every level of organisations. Leadership is not about the top proposition. Why do I um, think you won't get uh, diversity without positive discrimination? I don't think it's an evil, I think it's absolutely essential. The proposition that we have, transparency must be complete, I suggest is not actually deliverable in the complex society that we have today. So why should I believe that because I say we're competent, that that's enough? And transparency is actually how we illustrate the assertion and allow everybody else who funds us and in whose interests we work to make their judgments about us. When you have boards that are developed in their own image, they do say the same things and they fail to notice risk because they all believe each other's propaganda because they all come from the same backgrounds. My worry about positive discrimination, and I have to confess I have a great deal of empathy with it, is its lastability. Its lastability is not there. It doesn't last enough for me. This, every day I just saw that these diverse teams, it was harder to get them to work together, but when they did, the result was very powerful uh, and more importantly, very enduring.